Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan Jones, the communications officer with Forgen. Uh, today, uh, I will be giving you an all, all an update on the exciting contract that we've just signed with Histologics, a UK-based firm that is going to be conducting an histology study on our behalf. I'm joined today by senior staff members at Forgen as well. Yes, I am Tyler Droz. I am the chief operations officer. And I'm Eric Cunningham, chief science officer. And I'm William Yusa. I'm a scientific advisor. And we're all here uh, to just kind of give you all to have a conversation and keep you all in the loop on our histology study. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about what a histology study is. I know um, before we got involved with this, I didn't know what one was and I wasn't sure. Uh, I didn't know how important it was. So we want to include everyone else in and um, inform you all. So William, do you want to talk about what a histology study is and why we're doing it? Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. So the study of histology is the study of cells, the tissues they put, they um, compose, and the structures composed of those tissues. The structure of the tissues is directly related to their function. So histology is related to anatomy and physiology. Uh, histology is also used in biomed uh, biomedical research to identify the causes and possible treatments for diseases. And it uses tools like microscopes, antibodies, custom proteins, and computer algorithms to help identify that information and organize it. Great. So I'm curious about, you know, what kind of histology studies have been done in the past? Because I, I do know that, you know, there's some information out there in the scientific landscape on, on what the foreskin is and how it functions and sort of the an in-depth look at, at the anatomy. And I just want to know if you could help our supporters understand why it's important for us to conduct a new one. Are there ways that we're going to improve on what's been done in the past uh, and so forth? That's an excellent question. Uh, this isn't a standalone study. This was put together and we, we had a lot of discussion into how this was going to be uh, structured based on previous studies. There are a few researchers in the past, fairly recently in, in the 90s and 80s, Taylor and Cole, Taylor and Taylor, that had probably the best research out there from that, from that time previous to what we're doing. And uh, the main problems that we've been finding is or main problems that we've been finding with these older research papers is the lack of information because they were either in black and white, they were done with samples that were sourced, uh, sourced in ways that weren't exactly uh, replicatable, or they were done in ways that they just didn't have enough funding for certain tools that are available to us now. And uh, certain things just weren't available at the time, like computer algorithms that could count the cells and certain fluorescent microscopy techniques. Great. We are going to be able to contribute a great deal of new information, new scientific information about those that in-depth look the, uh, on what the foreskin is that we weren't able to see in the past. And I guess for my next question, I'd, I'd like to direct this to Eric. And I wanted to ask you what you're hoping that we may discover that can add to this landscape of, of activism, of promoting the foreskin, of trying to understand what it is and and uh, why it's really important to, to sort of keep it intact. So kind of to piggyback off kind of what William was saying, most of the literature that's been published historically on the human foreskin is kind of difficult to, to make any functional use out of because, uh, like I said, the, the imaging capabilities back then, like in the 1950s and 60s and even before, not all that great. Uh, when the slides were published in journals, they were black and white. And if you look at tissue just in general, it really is kind of just uh, one uniform color. It's very difficult to kind of differentiate. And so that's one reason uh, stains are used. So you can differentiate cell types and tissue types and whatnot. There hadn't really been a whole lot published until 1996 with uh, Taylor et al., uh, where they really kind of did the first real kind of uh, histological investigation of what is or what the, the, the tissue of the uh, uh, human foreskin is in the, in the structure of it. Kind of just generally speaking on just the literature, there's a huge gap in, in the body of knowledge, intimate details in histological details of the human foreskin. So there's been a fair amount over the last like 20, 30 years uh, published on kind of the structures, like so you got the frenulum, different areas that uh, uh, McGrath has done a lot of that. There's some uh, that people have published on, you know, some immunological functions. Others have talked about, you know, the, the mechanical gliding function 
so it's all it been it been very like kind of macro level, so to speak. Nobody is really, to my knowledge, has really dug into details of the the structure of the tissue itself. So one of the things that we're most interested in with this is uh, specifically the the kind of the number of neurons or excuse me nerve endings because there's been a lot of I'll say myth that has kind of been perpetuated over the last twenty years and we kind of since our goal is to you know is to regenerate and reconstruct the tissue as perfectly as possible one huge aspect of it is the sensory function of the foreskin and to, in order to be able to do that we need to have this really kind of in-depth look into uh, the the tissue structure the different cell types uh, kind of their distribution where they're located at and all kind of things of that nature great um it sounds like this is going to be very useful. And I think there are many people in the community who are eager to take a look at the results um, once we have them. There are also people who are interested in the tangible effects that this research will have for us in terms of moving forward on our mission to establish a technology that will allow men to regenerate the foreskin that they would have had um, had it not been removed. So I want to ask uh, you, Tyler, actually, what role um, you feel that this study will play, particularly in the context of our future human clinical trials. Yeah, I mean, it's actually something, it's not even just like something that we want to do or that we think, oh, we're going to have some nice data from this. But it's something that is really a prerequisite for the human clinical trials that we'll be ultimately conducting. Since when our scientists actually go to regenerate or regrow this tissue, obviously they need to have kind of a standard or something to compare it to. So having a really detailed and well-planned and, and thought out study that gives us this information that tells us exactly how the foreskin is structured, what it's composed of, the different cell types, quantification of that, that can really kind of give us an idea of the regrowing generally matches that. Obviously, there's going to be natural differences in the body, but the point is that when we actually do that, we have something to compare it to. There's actually data there that, you know, we can look at and use kind of as a standard. You know, kind I of maybe want to jump in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I kind of want to add, add on to that because that's kind of it, much more short term. There is a, another kind of more long term application, which would be in the biofabrication of scaffolds in the future. So one of the, uh, this, and this is a challenge for just tissue engineering and biomaterials as a whole is availability of donor tissue. So one of the reasons that, or one of the things that has been dri driving um, biomaterials research has been basically to develop alternatives so we don't need to use donor tissue. So for instance, one, one of the kind of examples is like if somebody has a damaged heart, if we can develop ways to repair the heart as opposed to trying to find like a, uh, get that person a heart transplant, much more practical. Um, that kind of reality extends to everywhere in biomaterials and tissue engineering. Because of that, you know, we are going to be looking into ways to fabricating uh, foreskin scaffolds and kind of the future of that is in like uh, 3D bioprinting and a lot of the new kind of advances that have been made there. Uh, but when you're fabricating a scaffold, because this is kind of my, my area, biomaterials, your kind of goal is to develop your scaffold in such a way that it mimics, I won't, I won't, I won't say exactly because there, there are some, I'll say like chemical cues and some uh, mechanical cues that you can't alter to get, uh, to get cells to do very specific things, but generally speaking, you want it to maintain the same mechanical properties, man, maintain the same structural architecture of that matrix as is found in the uh, uh, native extracellular matrix. So uh, this histological study, just due to how um, thorough and meticulous it's, it's going to be, is really kind of getting the ball rolling uh, and getting us like, it's really that very first step that needs to be taken to kind of, uh, for us to really kind of go down that pathway and start actually getting that uh, research and development going. Excellent. I think that that's an important point to make as well about the long-term impacts of this research. And I feel like this information is going to be important uh, in terms of our communication strategy overall. So I wanted to, to ask you Tyler, as well, about what some of the what are what some of the important aspects are of this study in terms of informing the public, producing new information that uh, not only we can use as an organization to promote our work, but people in the wider community can use on their own if they wish in terms of activism or raising awareness about this issue. Well, yeah, obviously, like our our donors kind of look to us to really not only obviously just conducting you know research that's going to be getting our procedure out to the public, 
but also doing something that's you know novel and something that's kind of building on what we talked about here in this uh, recording kind of in the past where we're kind of providing like an updated study on this particular aspect of our anatomy of the foreskin. And I think really what's important about it is that getting this information out there is something that can draw a lot of attention to the subject. You know, if we can make this, you know, this, this new study that's very detailed, that has a lot of new data that hasn't even really been, you know, we don't really have, and it's something that's going to be very uh, unique. I think that's going to also help to kind of draw in, you know, people, maybe also not even just in the scientific community, but also other people who are, you know, donors or who are interested in the project, or maybe never even heard of the subject before, or just kind of, it's just, it's very kind of, it's more kind of in the background for them, you know, the whole idea of, you know, why the force can remove, you know, why don't, why don't I have one or, you know, what's kind of the whole deal with this and putting that information out there really kind of helps to, I think, draw in a lot of attention and get people kind of interested in what we're doing. Like I said, from the academic side, but then also just the general public side of it as well. And, you know, Ryan obviously is our communication officer. I'm not sure if there's certain aspects that, you know, kind of you wanted to discuss, but um, that's kind of what my point of view is on it and just kind of what we can accomplish with this. Yeah, def- for sure. Uh, there are some aspects of, of the PR side I'd like to discuss. And I just think that as you were saying that, I'm reminded of the fact that we have been seeing in some medical textbooks, little um, glimmers of hope, you know, like we're seeing some textbooks be a little more forthcoming about the benefits of having a foreskin. Um, I know I've seen one recently, I can't recall the name exactly, where they talk about how the foreskin actually is the most sensitive part of the penis and how removing it can have an effect on, on your sexual experience. And so I think that, uh, you know, in that textbook, if I re- recall, drew upon perhaps the Sorel study, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. But I think that, you know, when we produce this research with histologics, that may be research that's drawn upon by future, you know, medical textbooks. Um, or, you know, journalists out there who may want to write an article about that, or so on and so forth. So I do think this information is going to be important to sort of infuse into the wider public through different domains. But also for us on the, on the public relations side and the communication side, I think that producing novel research is an important component of many nonprofits um, activities. And by doing that, we can inform our own mission and we can prove and demonstrate that we are sort of moving the ball forward in our domain. And I think that this research will inform potential, you know, future fundraising campaigns, you know, wider public awareness campaigns. And um, again, to your point before, where you said that uh, some people who may not know anything about this subject may be drawn in by this research. I, I totally agree. I think that there are a lot of people who haven't thought about this subject before at all. And if they come into contact with information about the nerves in the foreskin or the mucosal, the aspects of the mucosal tissue or the corpuscles, um, they can see it from a scientific angle, see it coming from histologics, which is a professional scientific research organization, understand, wow, you know, this is information I can trust. So I think that this, this study is going to be important on so many levels. So that kind of brings me to my next question. I just wanted to ask, ask all of you, you know, if, if anyone has, has an opinion, if you want to weigh in, what uh, some of the implications are going to be for this, for our, our movement and the cause in general of promoting, you know, awareness of the foreskin and just sort of um, being positive about it and why it's an important part of the human body and why we should preserve it. And um, for those who unfortunately um, have had theirs removed and, and either regret it or never had a say in the first place, why our organization is so important in providing that technology that will allow men to heal and allow men to, to regain what, um, what was taken. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, really just kind of a touch on it broadly then William and Connie, I want to get your input as well. You know, there's just such a, a dearth of knowledge or just kind of a lack of knowledge when it comes to this and just really kind of an understanding of it. Yeah, not even in the U S but as many other countries as well, as we can see that, you know, we get communications from, you know, from supporters or donors, you know, everywhere from the U S to Australia, to South Korea, to, you know, to, to China. I mean, there's all, you know, people all over the world who, you know, have kind of told us that this is something that, you know, obviously for, for them, our project is really kind of a serious, like hope for them. They want to be able to take advantage of a procedure, but then also just getting this information out there because it's not even, like I said, it's not even just the U S it's many other countries too, that maybe don't have access to data like this or well, not even just access, but doesn't really exist. So kind of getting this out there, I think will not only just impact, you know, Forgen's ability 
to offer obviously our procedure and to help men, but then also just in general with, you know, medicine and just the medical community, you know, hopefully then kind of updating kind of the way they approach this issue, what the recommendations are or how they kind of view it just in general. Yeah, I think uh, Tyler, like kind of just elaborating a little bit on, on some of the points you hit, add, adding to the scientific knowledge, adding to the base of scientific knowledge, making that knowledge available to uh, the people that have been funding us, uh, funding for gen and, and being able to use that information for something as impactful as this is just, you don't get to see that a lot of times. The, usually the progression of research is, um, or progression of change being made is very slow. So hopefully this will keep carrying on at the pace it's carrying on, maybe even pick up pace a little bit, but um, definitely the, uh, the, share, the ability to publish that information, get that out there and uh, hopefully change the minds of a lot of different medical institutions in the US, or at least have that information available for people who may have to make that decision or who may be able to make that decision for themselves. Um, having the correct information at their disposal, I think is, it would be a huge plus for, especially for us in the United States, where there is a huge bias uh, against previews or foreskin and there is a huge a misunderstanding and misconception around it as well. Yeah, and kind of uh, to back up what William has said, because he mentioned that, that function follows from form, because the form part of the body both enables, constrains the function. And I can't think of a single part of the body that doesn't follow that rule where you can alter the form and not change the function. Now, granted, there are people who say advocates who um, maintain that that is the purpose, like is to change the function specifically, like, I guess, for prophylactic benefits, which are pretty dubious. But I think a lot of it kind of comes down to just ignorance where it becomes a lot easier to justify the removal of part of the body if you just fundamentally do not understand what it is and what it does. And uh, there has been a quite a bit of a, a change over like last 20 years with a lot more people publishing work and publishing on it because there, there's a lot of cultural bias that is, is is in the way that has to kind of be gotten over but i think th this particular work i think will kind of help to kind of get us over that that hill because it's, it's going to kind of just reach a point where it just kind of becomes undeniable it, it, it kind of already is in such a way, if you just think of just very basic, you know, rules of uh, biology, but this, I think with what this is, I think will really kind of hit home because the Sorrell study in 2007, which showed the uh, uh, fine touch uh, pressure thresholds, and it showed kind of the kind of distribution of where they're at, which parts are kind of more sensitive than others. That paper, in my opinion, is, is really kind of the, the definitive a sensitivity kind of study just based on how thorough they were with their methodology because a lot of others that have kind of argued the opposite that circumcision does nothing to uh, alter sensitivity uh, if you really kind of read through those their methodology is incredibly poor so i think in kind of the same way that the sorrel study kind of really does kind of put that myth to rest i think this will kind of do the same to kind of the the myth that the foreskin is just you know a piece of skin and uh there's a line that I have written that I'm actually going to be using in my upcoming ethics uh, essay, where it's really kind of more of a dissertation at this point for how how big it is. But people maintain that you can, you know, oh, it's just a snip, it's just just a piece of skin, it's whatever. But that ignores the 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 kind of truth that even a small stone thrown into a pond has a noticeable disturbance. If you like, I said, going back to the. Uh, form and function, you alter the form, you're going to alter the function. That's just, that is biology. That is how it works. Yeah, uh, I agree. And again, I think that in addition to people who may be surprised by what is uh, discovered in the study, I think that there are also many people out there who are, um, you know, have specific questions in their mind that they want to have answered. So there, there may be people out there who do want to get, well, there are people out there who want to get a more definitive answer on how many nerve endings there are in the foreskin, or if there are, you know, hormone receptors and what kind of a role they play or um, things like that. So I think that um, some people will be surprised and, and, and taken by surprise and others will have specific uh, questions that they want to have answered. And I think that this is going to serve them as well. So, uh, you know, in summation, this is a very exciting development for us at Forgen, and it's a very exciting development for our community. 
and we can't wait to move forward um, on this histology study. Um, does anyone else have any closing remarks they'd like to add to our conversation? Um, for anyone who's interested, Ryan, where could they find more information or where could they go to learn how to help fund us? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question, William. So for those who'd like to learn more about our organization, we can be found at forgen.org. So there are uh, very uh, simple ways to navigate through our website. And one of our prominent tabs is called research. So if you want to go on, hop on our website, click on the research tab, we have a great rundown on uh, what we're doing why we're doing it. Um, you know, if you'd like to contribute to our operations, uh, please consider doing so. You can navigate over to forgen.org forward slash donate. And um, we do have the option to, for you to, you know, offer a monthly contribution, uh, which is a really great way for us to have, you know, reliable support to continue our research. And, um, Again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Uh, we are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, you know you can also uh, find our email, our contact information on our website. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna say, don't forget about the social media. Ryan's kind of he's really gonna kind of help people keep people informed there by posting a lot of the updates as the histology study goes along, um, yeah. and kind of putting out like the small ones that we have, or even big ones as well. Anything that we kind of think is important to share. And also, I wanted to add one thing too. If you're interested, we also put out a uh, monthly newsletter as well. So you can go and you can sign up on our homepage or on Commentarium. And that's if you want to get some of the updates at the end of the month. And then we also have our YouTube channel as well. So we also put out a video format with the newsletter and also some other content too, like this recording, I think we'll be putting up there. So if you keep an eye on that, if you kind of prefer more of a, you know, a video or audio visual format, that's something that we provide as well. Uh, Great. Well, thank you all for taking the time uh, to have this conversation. We hope, uh, you know, our audience uh, enjoyed it and we hope you're as excited as we are. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us, but uh, there's a great rundown on our operations on our website and uh, we will, uh, you know, you'll hear from us again in the future. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll talk soon.